Okay, so the lady told me at the desk that we are allowed to video here inside the uh, museum. Uh, just no flash photography and no, yeah, just no flash on the camera. So let's go ahead and tour the museum. Uh, we're starting out first. We are starting out, of course, in the beginnings of when Florida's first people. And of course, they were the you know, archaeolog archaeologic gists. Hillsboro River came to the bay, provided many resources like alligators, birds, fish, and self self fish, shellfish. Deer, turkey, raccoons, wild plants were found in the nearby forests and grasslands. The mild climate permitted the cultivation of squash, pumpkins, beans, and maize. This is the early, uh, earliest part of Florida. Uh, Tano, the Ocal, Cura, Freshwater, Gualtina, Appalachia, and then you have the Colusa. And then you check out. Now I'm going to Miami. Now towards Miami, what is now known as Miami. So we have the Quista. The Quista. Uh, and the place Miami. Miami. We're right there. This is the earliest part. And then of course Pensacola. And it's still known as Pensacola today. And then these are all the only tools used. Uh, and uh, for early, early settlements to use to make food and uh, build it and build things, uh, carpentry. Let's say for food, for scraping out food, getting food off of trees and plants. Uh, everything else. Of course, you see the rope. You use a really thin rope, it looks like. Tools from the bay. Most of the shells they used because of the hard edges on shells and sharp. It was used as a cutting tool. Cutting the fish. And stuff. Of course, we also got the famous bow and arrow used by the uh, Seminoles and the uh, Maya, the Indians, and the Native Americans, for hunting. High tech made simple. Set bow and arrow, shafts were shaped to hardwood, long strips of deer skin, served with bow strings that accurately propelled the arrow at a great distance. Something like this gentleman is doing. Oh my. What did Florida's people use to catch fish? They used a spear, didn't they? What did they use? Let's see. That's in hooks. Size of the opening net and big legs. How could some of the holes? Someone ever made holes in shells and limestone. I don't know. Really Shark tooth drill. Moving the bow back and forth rotates the bit. You can see right there, right there. So the shark tooth there, and then as they go to in and out, it sharpens it. Something a lot like this. These containers, they use this item. Like they gotta build a raft kind of out of a tree bar. Uh, it's kind of like a canoe. Let's see the young lady carrying a basket of fish. That's what we go here. See, this young lady is a tourist trade, isn't she? the Tim Miami, Tim Miami Trail. 
through the Florida Everglades in 1928, brought unsended numbers of tourists into the world of the Seminoles and the Cuskies. Families began working in tourist villages to take advantage of this increased contact with outsiders, earning extra money by making crafts to sell in gift shops. This young lady is, is uh, sewing some sort of scarf, some type of shawl, uh, as part of a dress. The Knight Collection. Charles L. Knight was a surveyor and property appraiser by trade and an anthropologist by training, member of the Seminole tribe by virtual tribal degree. He began purchasing items from Seminole and the Muskogee artisans around 1940. He did also he did so partially to support his friends and neighbors, also because of his genuine interest in American Indian culture. Knight cataloged and cared for this vast collection of carvings, dolls, clothing, patchwork sample archaeological artifacts that are North, now part of the Tampa Bay, His Tampa Bay History Center collection. I cannot talk today. This is one of the Seminoles of Florida. Let's see right there. Several people earn a reputation for their resourcefulness, for perseverance and strength, having integrated the cultures of escaped slaves, pioneering Europeans and several distant American Indian groups. Earliest homelands, most of north central Florida, reaching as far south as Tampa Bay. Northern border was a place of tension between the constantly growing Seminole population and encroaching white settlers who claim land ownership and wish to create grazing lands, homesteads on traditionally unowned land. These are some of the Seminole dolls that they have, that they uh, made. And of course we got the, although the Florida Seminoles were never totally defeated, numbers were greatly diminished. White settlers continued pushed deeper into Florida, forcing tribes to remain within protection of Everglades. A century of struggling for their rights of land, they began moving on reservation lands and seeking representation from federal government. The Unified Seminole Tribe of Florida was officially recognized by the United States in 1957, and the Makuski Tribe of Indians of Florida received recognition in 1962. And, of course, this went from resisting to removal. Andrew Jackson passed the Indian Removal Act, forcing removal into Florida's Indians' population, spurring the Second Seminole War from 1835 to 1842. While most accepted removal from Florida, others resisted and fought, and fought in the Seminole War. By 1858, about 700 people remained. The nucleus of today's Seminole and Makoski tribes. This is more of just a map of all the Indian Wars, or all the Seminoles, and where each land was, and where they traveled. Of course, we've got the Fort Brook. It's here in Tampa. Uh, then you got Fort King in Orlando. That was the third Seminole War from, for three years. And as you move up from Old Town, St. Mark's in Tallahassee, Pensacola, the, um, that, I will not say that, um, and as you go across here, this is where all they travel, and then ended up in Fort, uh, Bear, Barancas, Barancas. That's where the, from Fort Brook, they traveled the Gulf all the way up through New Orleans and all the way up to, well, um, 
Where in the world are we? Okay, this is, okay, this is Mississippi right here. This is Mississippi. Okay, Tennessee is way up there. Okay. So we're in New Orleans, Arkansas. We traveled all the way up through Little Rock, Fort Coffee, and then ended up to Fort Smith, and then they traveled west. So that's, that's, this is kind of the outline of the standing ground of the Seminole Wars and how they traveled. So we're going to go upstairs now to the second floor. And from upstairs to the second floor, from there, I'm gonna travel and end up in uh, present day uh, Tampa Bay. So that was the early settlements of when the Seminole Indians, uh, Native Americans, first settled in Florida and ended up finding Tampa Bay. Okay, this is fun. Where are we at? First name, city, I'll find out what it is. State. I can't find it. Oh, this is Metal Tampa. Yeah, because that's the Air Force Base right here. I've not been here, but I would like to go sometime. This is the Bob Tower Gardens, right here. Uh, I'll put a link in the description down below, but it did talk about the uh, uh, Bob Tower Gardens in uh, this county, Polk County. I really want to go here. So this place. Fort DeSoto Park. It says Pinellas County was the last county created out of the historic Hillsborough County. It is home to Fort DeSoto Park. It consists of five interconnected islands. Fort DeSoto Beach, with its fine white sand, is considerably voted as one of the best in the United States. So this is the, uh, this is the fort, oh, or where the fort was, just on the outside of Pinellas County. Of course, there's the long bridge that connects Hillsborough County to Pinellas County. We have fort, fort. Homosea Springs State Wildlife Park with any manatees. Okay, I've not been to that either. Now, um, I will go to that eventually. I'm going to Manatee County. I've been to Manatee County, but I've not been to this. Alright, let's continue walking around. This looks like. Johnson was hired in Hillsborough County Commission to survey the map of the village of Tampa. The final survey detailed large and sold the finance building county courthouse. And 
how Tampa came about, of course, in the Civil War, as always. Uh, during the Civil War, Fort Brook was occupied by members of the Confederate Army and the state military. The fort was bombarded by Union blockading ships and were temporarily seized and occupied in May of 1864 by the Union Army. So this is Fort Brook area. And ships came in, blockade hit, and it was uh, seized by the Union Army uh, in this location. Explore Florida by the business of the early 1500s. I like Juan Ponce de Leon, Pedophilio de Narvez, and Hernando de Soto explored coastal and interior Florida. They sought to claim land and, and the riches of health. This was in 1500s. And after a series of attempts by the Spanish during the 16th century, established on the shores of Tampa Bay. The area was largely ignored until the early 1800s. However, some settlers, including Cuban fishermen, Seminoles, and escaped slaves, did seek refuge in the wilds of what was then known as South Florida. And they found Fort Brooke. Established on the mouth of the Hillsborough River, 1824. Soldiers at Fort Brook were charged with watching over problems between Seminole Indians and white settlers. And that was hit the Second Seminole War from 1835 to 1842. Fort Brook served as U.S. Army headquarters and the main point of the embark for Seminoles being removed to the west. Then a great hurricane of, eight, of 1848 struck Tampa on September 25th, 1848. First hand account from Major RDS Wade at Fort Brook reported that the wharf and most buildings at the fort were destroyed on September 25th. Fort survival sale and sport. For thousands of years, human survival depended on fishing. The sea was hooks and nets. Riches of Tampa Bay attracted Spanish. That fish from it is really as many. 17th century, it's early 1700. There are some Indians and Spanish. By 1877, Cuban fishermen were taking mullet at established fishing and ranch. By 1895, Florida industries including fishing, oystering, sponging, and taking the sea turtles and alligators, eventually commercial shrimping, began, began and by 1950s, fishermen were pulling up millions of pounds of pink gold. I didn't realize that was a thing. What is oystering and sponging? What? Unfortunately, this will be there to close, but we will always know about the trains. Henry B. Plant's Railroad owned the South Florida Railroad, a plant system of railroads and steamships connecting Tampa and Florida to other states, ports around the Gulf of Mexico, Atlantic Ocean. Beginning in the 1800s, its transportation lines opened up small village of Tampa to widespread trade, tourism, and industrial development. This is kind of how it began. Once it, did, once it had that, we had passenger trains, streetcars connected homes and hotels of downtown Tampa, as, you, as we also see outside the uh, trolley, and surrounding them runs with the waterfront. Port Tampa City, an important part of the area. The early port system was connected to the city of Tampa by a single railroad line in the Tampa Electric Company streetcar line. So here you see the streetcars real close like you see it has that wire right here above them. That's what connects it, what makes it go. Of course here you have the trolley as well. 
over here, you've got this box of, uh, like what would be on a cargo ship. Uh, and supplies, you got, let's see, you got food supplies, you got and, and multiple, um, clothing, produce, plants, sometimes animals, small animals. We also have Florida citrus. Florida is very well known for their oranges. For Tampa. Of course, we've got those postcards, memorabilia, all of them. We've got stuff in here. Well, there is actually a uh, there's actually a big orange museum that is in Orlando. Uh, off of in International Drive. It's on International Drive. And, uh, I've not been there yet, but I will go sometime. And I would like to see what's inside. I think there's a big gift shop, but they do give away free orange juice. And I'll take anything about free orange juice. So, um, on to our next one. exhibit. We've got the memories of the growth stands. Old cars, of course, you've got the young lady picking oranges. And oranges are very good for you. Young, young, young boy there. Getting these oranges on his uh, st uh, wagon. Or, well, small cart. This is what the beginning of the citrus oranges. So looked after Spain ceded the Florida territory to the United States in 1821. Uh, Florida oranges became part of the continental economy. 1823, Count Odette Bibbett arrived in Tampa Bay from the Bahamas with the carefully selected citrus seeds, small seedlings, and large fruit-bearing trees. One of his seedlings became the parrot tree of the Duncan grapefruit standing among the Florida varieties. Huh. So we can thank the Spanish for bringing over oranges and how they started up here in this here in the state of florida however they did start here right here in tampa bay very cool this is ah this is just a large cow so land of the plan and then leave your mars brands like these were created by cattlemen based on their family names or the names of their ranches what would your name, what would you name your ranch? Symbolize the ranch in simple graphic brand. Use a magnet on the tray on the right and, and leave your mark on the historic cow. So mine would be, I have no idea, honestly. Should be fun. Cowboys and cow hunters. We can't ride on these other things. Yeah, push the button. I should do that. Can we do it?
Glen Florida Pal Hunters use the McLean saddle rather than a Western style. McLean is simple and light, sturdy enough to give good support to the rider. It is gear it has an open seat. This leather skirt, wooden stirrups, and a girth strap made of wool, wool and yarn. Absence of saddle horn fitted on the western saddle for hanging rope, allowing the rider a great ease of movement, particularly when mounting and dismounting. Sports section. Tampa Tarpon. Big fish. Boxing bulls. Huh, even got the Steelers in here. I guess the Steelers won in the Super Bowl on January 28, 2001. Take it there again. It's the 205, that's Super Bowl. I don't know what number that is. But, uh, one of the area's earliest football games took place in 1903. Pitting soldiers from Eatmont Key against a squad from Tampa. Attendance was low, with the Tampa Morning Tribune commenting that a baseball game would have attracted a much larger crowd. Over 100 years later, attendance at football games is rarely a problem. Fans turn out by the tens of thousands to see the Tampa Bay Bucks and the University of South Florida Bulls. High school football is popular too, with Hillsborough County producing two state champions, Armwood and Plant, since 2004. Wow. Of course, we got the University of South Florida Bulls, the, oh, the Redskins, and the Steelers apparently played in Super Bowl, whatever number that is, on January 22nd of 1984. Of course, that's the Tampa Bay Bucks. And I'm right here. Lamar Sparkman. Uh, in appreciation of his creative development of the image of the National Football League's newest member's logo, the Buccaneer. It's kind of cool. Nineteen seventy six, the Tim Ticket first Tampa Bay Buccaneer home game. First exhibition game was on in nineteen seventy six. Nineteen seventy seven was the middle piece of Tampa Stadium Goldpost program. First Buccaneer home victory. Nineteen eighty five, the Tampa Bay Bucks present ten years of the uh, of their stay here. And then uh, in two thousand three ticket to Super Bowl 39. I don't know. Was it 2003? 1996 to 2007, the helmet was signed by the Tampa Bay Buccaneer Mike Alstott. Jersey Tampa Bay Buccaneer 88, Bar Barry Smith. There he is, Barry Smith. How she got. Now you can just move on into baseball. Baseball, you know, you got the Tampa Bay Rays. They used to be called the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. You got the Battle of the Pirates. You got the, this is a big rival. The, the Bucks and the Raiders. You've got the Tampa Bay Lightning. Yep. And then you got my 
between us. A little slugger. Bat a war. Cigar City Baseball. Steven Stamkos. Seen Stamkos? My team, my game, my team, and my town. Autographed picture of Stamkos. Steven Stamkos. I see Tampa Bay. I think they be the least likely sport to take root in the Tampa Bay area, but it has. Tampa Bay Lightning played their first season at Florida State Fairgrounds Expo Hall, followed by three seasons at St. Petersburg Thunderdome, now called Camp Field. St. Pete Times Forum, known as the Ice Palace, opened in 1996. It's the Lightning's permanent home in downtown Tampa. The Ice Sports Forum, team's practice facility in Brandon, hosts a wide variety of activities from youth hockey leagues to figure skating events. And speaking of that, speaking of that, shout out to my both my nephews who play hockey at that very same arena at the Ice Forum in Brandon. Uh, I was able to go watch them last weekend. I may go this Friday to go see them again. And yes, that is where the Tampa Bay Lightning practice uh, for their games. As we move on to the, uh, this is the. Uh, Florida's maritime heritage. Uh, coastal communities like Cortez, Gulfport, and Ruskin take full advantage of their locations, drawing locals and tourists to the water, seafood festivals, fishing tournaments, and folk festivals. Uh, one need not to be a professional athlete or a member of an organized team to enjoy the region's offering of year round pleasure pursuits. Hundreds of beaches and parks, 35 miles of hills, for a waterfront, and over 150 miles of coastline draw residents and tourists alike at any given time of the year to gather and celebrate the culture, natural, and agricultural heritage of Hillsborough County. Hillsborough River is guarded by the rowing community as one of the finest winter training sites. Weather is certainly a factor, but the caliber of teams who travel south to train on their waterway, which also includes Hillsborough Bay and the channels around Davis and Harbor Islands. Real and soon colleagues from around the county, including traditional college powers such as Yale, Purdue, Duke, own their skills and waters around downtown Tampa. Which is very interesting. I did not know that. That's really cool. Of course, you got the old pennants. You got Festival of the States. Petersburg. Festival of the States? What is that still a thing? You got Purdue. You got Duke up there. Virginia. And Georgetown. Mr. Nolan for Tampa Sports Leisure History for Miles and Pickens. Who is this? Plant, Plant City High School. This is here at Plant City High School. We have a lot of them that come into Chick-fil-A. Plant City Panthers. From 2006 state champs, 2000s. Yep. Won the state championship of Florida. The Sunshine Skyway Bridge. Very popular. Alright, we're going to stop right here. This is part one of the History Museum. We're going to go into part two and go into level three and four because there is a big surprise awaiting at that top of the journey. See you then.